A Green Bay Packers defensive back calling out Debo Samuel and 49ers tight ends, among many others, hit the ground in Nashville at George Kittle's tight end. You, my takeaways from who I see and what I see from who I see amongst 49ers tight ends at TEU. Coming up on today's Locked On 49ers. You are Locked On 49ers. Your daily San Francisco 49ers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On 49ers, Brian Peacock and Eric Crocker at BD Peacock at Crocky 209. Thanks everybody for making us your first listen on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We love our everydayers and uh, we especially love and appreciate it when you hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you are listening to this podcast today's episode of locked on 49ers is brought to you by game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nfl for 20 dollars off your first ticket purchase terms apply uh so this one hit right before we went on crock you said that there was a uh, some some trash talk happening in the nfl and then the off season we love a little bit of trash talk and uh k adams had green bay packers defensive back Keyshawn nixon on her uh up and adams up and Adams, right? It's the name of the show, uh, podcast. And uh, there, there's there's a quote in text where he said, "Will you will, will you drop it on me?" What, what he says exactly uh, in the quote? It's it's uh, but it's it sounds bad. The, the quote that's being reported is again Keyshawn Nixon, uh, defensive back. He says, "I'm sick of hearing them. They got to come to Lambeau Field and see us." Debo's annoying. So th- that's just the that's kind of the quote that's flying around. You know, if you're a 49er fan and you're on social media, that's what you see. This Packer player is sick of hearing about the 49ers and Debo Samuel's annoying. Yeah. And and this kind of reminds me of the the Brandon Ayuk thing. Brandon Ayuk's kind of smiling when he's like, they don't want me. They don't want me back, I swear. And like, is he just playing around and being weird? Uh, Off-season hijinks. Is he being serious? And so you, you, you... Press play and you listen to Keyshawn Nixon talking to Key, to uh, Kay Adams about Debo Samuel, and you realize, oh, they're just like buddies, and he's just messing around with them, right? It's something you you'd say to your friend. Some of the worst things I say about human beings are about my friends to their face when we're all together and having a good time, right? Like that's you could be mean to your friends, and I think that's what this is with Keyshawn Nixon and Debo Samuel, um, which I was kind of disappointed in. I was like, oh man, because when Debo's furious, we saw what happened with James Bradbury. It was like ending his career. I think he's get cut by the Eagles now. Uh, you don't want Debo Samuel mad at you and calling you out. Uh, I don't think this is one of those situations. Hassan Reddick said a lot of things about the 49ers, and I don't think he's friends with anybody, or at least none of the big dogs on, on the Niners team. A lot of blue uh, rules last year, a lot of crying, a lot of what if, a lot of this, a lot of that. They get a chance to come back in here, line that up, and prove it again. Hey, man, we'll catch you on Sunday. <laughs> He was serious, you know, like that wasn't yeah. fun back and forth. That was, I like, I'm just tired of hearing them, whatever the case. Keyshawn Nixon, it's clear, like, he was a college teammate with Debo Samuel for multiple years. You know, they get to the NFL, a lot of guys sometimes hang out in the offseason or they train together, and he had been, uh, Keyshawn had been doing that with Debo and D'Amador Lenore. So when he said, I'm sick of hearing them, he was talking about Debo Samuel and D'Amador Lenore specifically, and then said, uh, went on to say that Debo Samuels like to talk trash. Like it's on the phone that they're on FaceTime and Debo, he doesn't want to text you. He doesn't want to call you. He wants to FaceTime you so you can see him while he's talking trash to you. So it, it sounded like me and my buddies, you know, when, when something's coming up, you want to trash talk, you know, each other a little bit, just have a little fun with it. But I'm pretty sure come regular season, I think week, week 11, week 12, when the 49ers do play Green Bay Packers, it will be very serious that game day. Uh, yeah, they'll be serious when they're in between the lines. And Debo's a serious guy in between the lines. And uh, he, he's a, uh, he, I, I almost like it anytime Debo has extra motivation just because how he's wired and the way he plays. And uh, I like that about him too. He wants to tra- talk trash on FaceTime to your face. He's not even, he doesn't even want to be in text. Uh, uh, that's fantastic stuff. And he stood by everything he said, by the way, when it came to the Eagles trash that was being talked and there was a lot of it. Like that was the, the silence was deafening once that game happened last year, right? nothing else needed to be said from anybody, either team about that game. Like it was all put out there on the field. I I always talk about how I don't quite enjoy 
blowouts, right? Like I, because I'm a football fan before anything else, I just love watching good football games, games that, you know, kind of come down to the wire or it's, it's a very interesting game. I enjoyed, I loved every second of the 49ers whooping the hell out of Philadelphia Eagles. I, I loved it. I, it was, I think I may have had a little bit too much to drink. I mean, that right there, I enjoyed that. Hey, man, we'll catch you on Sunday. <laughs> Debo's about it. Uh, man, I love that. Uh, I want to bring up tight end university that George Kittle is putting on in uh, in Nashville as he does. And a lot of NFL tight ends are on hand. Dak Prescott on hand, throwing balls to those guys. Um, I haven't gotten the full report. And to be honest with you, I don't care about exactly all who was there, except for 49ers tight ends. And um, who's there and who's not, I find interesting. And David Lombardi is there recovering it. And he posted this picture on Twitter of four 49ers tight ends that are at tight end U, including George Kittle. And I've got multi multiple takeaways from one picture. So I'm going to put it up on the screen right now for those that are watching us on YouTube. And uh, I, I mean, I, I've there's so much I can take away from this one photograph. And the players in this photograph left to right are 49ers new uh, free agent veteran tight end Eric Saubert. There's George Kittle next. Then it's Mason Pline, who is the 49ers undrafted tight end, former college basketball player. And then on the right is Logan Thomas, a very newly signed veteran tight end by the 49ers. Takeaway number one is that George Kittle's tiny compared to these guys. Like This is a massive group of tight ends, Croc. Uh, and, and maybe the biggest standout is Eric Saubert's guns. And I could see why he cut off his T-shirt to let the guns breathe crock i mean this is and this is a wide tight end this is the guy who's going to replace you know charlie warner's role probably as a as a block first sort of a tight end um but he's ripped and i heard reports about otas and minicamp that he was a pretty big guy i didn't really know what that meant but you could see like he puts in some time in the weight room crock george Kittle listed at what six foot four these guys make him look like he's like six foot yeah <laughs> yes, the Sobert's big, and he's even shorter than Pline and, and Logan Thomas, who are both 6'6". I think Pline might even be close to 6'7". Uh, and so George Kittle looks small, and he's not a small guy, obviously. He's 6'4", 250, compared to these guys. So uh, the Niners have some size in their tight end room. Pline looking very large. Uh, there's been really good reports about Mason Pline, by the way, the undrafted rookie, looking natural as a pass catcher, even though uh, he spent most of his time in college playing basketball before converting to tight end the last couple of years and, and playing football when he transferred to Furman who uh, have a pretty good football program and have pumped out some tight ends actually from that school. Uh, and so good reports on him. He looks like he's put in time. He doesn't look like he has a basketball body. He looks like he's been playing <laughs> tight end for a while. Right. And, uh, and Logan Thomas, we already know is, you know, is a big old dude, former quarterback converted to a tight end six foot six, 250 pounds there too. So uh, some serious size at tight end for the 49ers. Definitely. 49ers definitely don't have any shortage of big guys there in the trenches. Uh, who's going to solidify themselves as that legit tight end, too? That's the big question. Uh, the other question is, where are the young guys? That's you know, the, that's maybe the biggest takeaway, Croc, that I had is no Cam Latu and no Brayden Willis, which is yeah. kind of a disappointing one because Brayden Willis, I thought, was in line to play that sort of a move tight end role, could be an H-back and uh, really you know, uh, immediately started out playing his counterpart from uh, the same draft class in Cam Latu. I think Latu is probably not healthy enough to still be doing these workouts, uh, which is, you know, not a great sign for him. So uh, not good that either one of those second year tight ends are at tight end university. So I was a little bit surprised by that. Maybe they, they're showing up later. Maybe they just weren't there this day, but they weren't there when this, uh, when this photo was taken. So uh, Braden Willis, interesting. Could he lose his roster spot to the undrafted guy in Pline? Because right now, I think, if healthy, Kittle and Sobert and Logan Thomas are all pretty well locked into roster spots, and that probably leaves at most one more tight end spot. Uh, and I had uh, Braden Willis penciled in. Cam Latu has to uh, show up, and maybe Cam Latu is someone that they're just going to stash again, and he starts on the pup list so they don't have to do anything with him roster-wise, and they can kind of buy some time with him. But could Mason Pline show up? and steal one of those roster spots away. It's a, a, that's, I think that's one of the good training camp battles here, but I really do think that George Kittle uh, 
if he gets hurt, is not playing, or his backup role is going to be kind of split between the inline Y tight end in Saubert and more of the move pass catching tight end in Logan Thomas. And I also got to say, man, shout out to George Kittle for really putting up this, putting on this tight end you thing every year. You know, th- this was something that between him and there were a couple other guys, but I think he was kind of one of the guys at the forefront of this, you know, having a tight end seminar. You got a bunch of tight ends all around the league that are coming together. And you know, I think, ty- uh, uh, I was going to say tight end, but George Kittle kind of made the tight end position a little bit more important, I, I feel like, or at least made these guys feel a little bit more important. It's, it's a really cool thing that he's doing. Yeah, it is cool. I mean, Travis Kelsey's there. I saw Greg Olson there is kind of one of the instructors now. He's like the uh, the camp counselor. And George I, I think they're a big part of it, too. I think those two. But I, I want to say it's like George Kittle was like really kind of at the forefront. And he's mm-hmm. like, hey, I can't do this on my own. Greg Olson, Travis Kelsey, you guys are big guys in the tight end community. Let's let's do this together. Yep, absolutely. And George Kittle talked about how he's like, I think this is like a golden era of tight ends. There's so many good ones in the NFL. And, uh, you know, goes beyond just all the big names and the starters that you know. So uh, pretty cool what what George Kittle does every uh, summer there. And quarterbacks like to go there and get some work, too. So fantastic stuff, uh, George Kittle. Good job there. I want to talk 49ers Mount Rushmore next, Croc. Who belongs on the Mount Rushmore all-time greats of San Francisco 49ers next? Today's episode of Lockdown 49ers is sponsored by Game Time. Game Time makes getting NFL tickets, Major League Baseball tickets, comedy, concert, theater events, any tickets you need. Game Time makes it faster and easier. And prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to kickoff. Killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying those tickets. Uh, I got some tickets to see the San Francisco Giants for $11. And you can buy tickets not only up to first pitch, but even an hour after a game or a concert starts. Uh, I love the views from your seat, panoramic view with your phone. You can kind of look around and move your phone around and it shows you exactly what it looked like as you look around from your seats. And no surprise surprise fees at checkout when you toggle on the all-in pricing feature. So, Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, taking a look at uh, the Mount Rushmore for the San Francisco 49ers, Croc. Um, earlier today, I, I did a podcast, and uh, thanks to one of our listeners, Ryan, uh, at Peacock and Williamson, that uh, asked about the Mount Rushmore in the NFL, and it kind of was a, a conversation that was spurred by uh, the the passing of Willie Mays and um, what he meant to baseball and being on baseball's Mount Rushmore. And so I kind of did a baseball Mount Rushmore. I did a couple of football Mount Rushmores, one for players, one for non-players. Real quick, who, who's your yeah. baseball? Who's on your baseball? Mount Rushmore. Uh, so my baseball Mount Rushmore is Willie Mays, Babe Ruth, all position players. I, I couldn't get any, I couldn't fit any pitchers on it, Croc. Uh, so it's Willie Mays, Babe Ruth, um, Hank Aaron, and uh, why am I forgetting who the other one was? Willie Mays, Babe Ruth. Barry Bonds? Barry Bonds. Yeah, Barry Bonds. Oh, Barry okay. Bonds. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, Barry Bonds and, uh, and uh, yeah, Babe Ruth and, and Hank Aaron. So Hank Aaron, the fourth one was the hardest one. Like, Barry deserves to be on it. I, I you, you can listen to podcasts to get all my takes. One of the takes I hate, and we've talked about this with the NBA stuff, and, and like, I think Wilt Chamberlain's the most disrespected NBA player when you talk about all-time greats, what he did. And I feel like it's the same for Babe Ruth in baseball. Um because what they were, they were just lapping the field. They were so much better than everyone else they're playing with. And it's always like, yeah, but they were playing against plumbers or whatever, you know, that, that sort of an argument. Um, like Babe Ruth, dude, is, is Jose Altuve going to go hit 20 home runs in 1919 with a 45 ounce hickory bat and no nutrition, no weight, uh, gym, like workout systems, no steroids i'm not saying that altuve's on steroids but uh you're trying to tell me that babe ruth couldn't at least have been a roided up like 
David Ortiz in today's game, swinging a toothpick of a bat compared to what he swung with just his natural ability, natural power, by the way, a great pitcher as well. So, um, you know, had a lot of physical ability. So yeah, I don't buy that stuff when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Babe Ruth. So Babe Ruth, all time great gets disrespected and it seems impossible that he would, but he does. So I put a lot of thumpers on there and, uh, and Willie Mays had the fewest home runs on the list at 660, and he lost a couple of seasons to the war in his early 20s. I mean, he would have been a 700 home run guy too. He might have actually broke Babe Ruth's record before Hank Aaron if he didn't have, if that wasn't for the uh, the couple seasons he missed early in his career. So, anyways, that was my MLB group. I, I gotta have real quick. I know nobody cares, but Barry Bonds, Ken Griffey, Randy Johnson, and I'm and I'm struggling for the fourth one, but those, those are definitely three guys off bat, like. Love those guys growing up. That now again, that's Eric Crocker's Mount Rushmore. But of the, uh, of the like my life Mount Rushmore, yeah, is a lot different than like just the entire history of of the game, Mount Rushmore. Um it's it's hard to get pitchers on there too. It was like you well, know, Randy was players. Randy was intimidating. Yeah, was, I mean, like, I mean Roger Cle- Roger Clemens, you could make the argument not only for an hour lifetime, but for like you know, in the history of the game. You know, he's probably one of the top five pitchers ever. Like, what? Nolan Ryan, eight no hitters or whatever it was. Um, uh, you know, Walter Johnson. You got to go back. But it's always like, man, the the position players, the everyday players trumpet for me. In the NFL, uh, I have um, Bill Walsh, Bill Belichick, George Hallis, who was the owner slash coach of the early Chicago Bears, and Vince Lombardi as the non-player Mount Rushmore. I want to hear yours for the players. So Mount Rushmore NFL and 49ers only Mount Rushmore truck. All right. Mount Rushmore NFL. You know what? No, let's start with 49ers. Okay. I think it's pretty kind of laid out simple for you. You have Joe Montana. Got to be up there. Steve Young. I feel like he's got to be up there. Jerry Rice. I probably should have started with him. Mm Mm-hmm. And then now the fourth spot, that's where it starts to get. And so if if I think the 49ers Mount Rushmore is almost too easy because if you are counting Bill Walsh, then he has to be the fourth. Or if you're counting, if you, if you're counting just the entire organization, if you're only counting players, then the fourth gets, I think a little bit more difficult, but there's, I mean, there's obviously some good options, but I think the conversation gets more difficult. Well, I don't think it's difficult at all because there's one guy who <laughs> had his best season of his career as a 49er. <laughs> he won defensive MVP you off the to, off the <laughs> podcast. Uh, if you say the name, I think you're going to say for a one year wonder, San Francisco 49ers. Is it really a one year wonder? Like, is that what we're going to call him? His career. That was the best year of this guy's career. Eric Crocky he here at Crocky 209 <laughs> is trying to say that a guy that played one year for a franchise should be on the Mount Rush, Rush one Rush, year chiseled out of granite. One year, defensive player of the year, Super Bowl. What more do you want from a player? Okay, just for you guys, I won't throw Deion Sanders on there, but he's definitely on mine. But we'll just say, all right, Patrick Willis. I like it because the, you, cause you, it opens up to I, I, Ronnie Lott, I think would be a huge consideration. For oh, him. Ronnie Lott, uh, Brian Ooh. Young. I mean, there, there's some really good. You know, Terrell Owens, Frank Gore. Frank Gore, yeah. How, how, you know, I think this is the gift and curse of rooting for, growing up, rooting for such a great organization. We're kind of spoiled with how great it has been throughout our lifetime. And you look at the, you know, what's going on now, a team that has gone to multiple straight conference championship games, you know, two Super Bowls in the last five years or whatever it is. And a lot of fans are very disappointed. So that's the curse part, right? The gift is, all that this organization has given us and the the culture and what's attached to the 49er name and legacy. The curse is just the expectations year in and year out when there are some teams, I mean, golly, I, I think there's some teams that haven't even like won a playoff game. And I think the, the Lions just won their first playoff game since like 1990 or something crazy. Yeah. They had one playoff win in the in Barry Sanders' entire career, and it was like his first or second year, and then didn't win a playoff game until this past season. 
So, so the Jets haven't won a playoff game, and I, I think they have the most, they're the longest drought in the NFL, and it's been over a decade. 2010, I think, was before Eric Crocker was there. The Eric Crocker Eric, curse going on with the New York Jets. They should have never cut me. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark Sanchez, it might be the Mark Sanchez curse. But uh, yeah. he, he, you know, he went to back to back. And now this is an interesting thing when you, when you build a roster a certain way. Um, which they did. They leaned heavily on the run and, and the defense. They went to back-to-back -back conference championship games with Mark Sanchez right away, right out the gate, his rookie year and his second year. Um, and then shortly after that, when I was there in 2013, you know, they essentially kind of benched him, put him on IR, and it was a Geno Smith show. And uh, things really, really haven't been the same since. <laughs> Yeah, Mark Sanchez had a really weird career because of how he was thought of and all of a sudden disappeared. There's a lot of quarterbacks like that where you think, oh, the franchise quarterback. And, dude, the NFL is, is like that, period. A player, they're like, oh, great, greatest player. Great player. Be best player in our organization. And two years later, it's like you can't give him away for free to another team. Yeah. Uh, next, Croc, your NFL Mount Rushmore. And got a good question about D'Amico Ryans and Robert Salas. Head coaching careers post 49ers next. All right, Croc, who is on your Mount Rushmore? I'm going to make one quick rule. You can have a 49er, but only one. Because you can make an argument for multiple 49ers on a, an NFL-wide Mount Rushmore. Now, you don't have to have a 49er, but if you have a 49er on there, you only get one. Well, I hit the mic what there. Forty nine er would it be? Is the question. So, since you don't consider Deion Sanders a forty nine er, I'm going to say Cowboy or Atlanta Falcon Deion Sanders. So he does not count as a forty nine er. All right. Okay. So, so we got prime. Anything, you're talking about the entire history of the NFL, or is this like your defeat? Your four favorite guys? These like, are just my four think? favorite guys. Like the guys that I feel like when I when I used to go outside in the yard and and I wanted to be like. Somebody like I did a lot of the things and try to mimic what these guys did. So this is this is Mount Crockmore. Mount Crockmore. Okay. Um, but it starts oh, with the. By the way, shout out to Dan Dibley, my former former radio colleague. He he used to do a bit about that. So it was always like Mount whatever blank more. So shout out Dan Dibley. Mount Crockmore. Let's go. Mount Crockmore definitely has a ring to it. Um, but, <laughs> it but but I, I got to start with Prime, and, and and I feel like there's a lot of guys when you grew up playing like defensive back or even off. I mean, he was a guy. I mean, how many guys played both ways in the NFL? Like he what, really had a season where he had like 40, 50 catches. Yeah. If Deion Sanders, let's say he never played DB and he was only a wide receiver college in the NFL, he would have been a, a pro bowl caliber wide receiver. Probably. Well, we saw a guy who played eight years in major league or nine years in the major league baseball. And like damn near was the uh, world series MVP for the Yankees. If they had won. I mean, just a tremendous career, really, in both sports Amazing. and definitely in the NFL. But the 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 culture that he brought to the NFL, kind of this certain level of swagger, um, brand building, I think he can be on that Mount Rushmore for many different reasons. So I got to start with prime time. Now, again, this is Eric Crocker's uh, or the, the Mount Crockmore. So next up, I'm going Tara Owens. And this is the only 49er I have on there. But, you know, my early years watching the 49ers, you know, it it wasn't Joe Montana and it was Jerry to an extent, but Jerry was, especially as I really started understanding what was going on, you guys got to remember in 96 when Dion, when, excuse me, when Dion, when Terrell Owens was drafted, I was like nine years old, 10 years old. So this was kind of that changing of guard of Jerry kind of being on his way out. And wow, who's this young guy that's dropping four balls in his playoff game and then all of a sudden he makes one of the biggest catches that i've seen in my life right and when steve young dropped back he slipped and wow like the four nines they, they beat the green bay packers like oh my goodness you know and i i had nightmares of green bay from the previous couple years so tara owens from that moment and just kind of what he did like that giants game that giants playoff game where he just went nuclear and I mean, just went absolute crazy. Jeff Garcia to Terrell Owens. 49ers were down really big in that game and came back. And then just really what he continued to do throughout his career, even with teams like Dallas Cowboys, going to the Cowboys, 
you know, breaking the record for most touchdowns in a season for, for that uh, organization. I mean, he was just such a special player and he played for a really long time. So um, shout out to Terrell Owens. He's got to be on my Mount Rushmore, even over Jerry. But again, I just, I just have more of a connection with Terrell Owens than yeah. I did Jerry. And I still acknowledge what Jerry did, but I just have more of a connection with, with Owens, if that makes sense. Don't, don't disrespect what Jerry was still doing in the mid nineties, especially pre ACL injury. He did have, he did look weird. Like I, I totally get when fans are like, oh, uh, Randy Moss is the best wide receiver ever. If the only Jerry Rice they ever saw was even the dude was catching 100 balls for the Raiders, but like you know, the, the Seahawks Jerry Rice, where his corn, corn rows started in the middle of the back of his head. It's like, okay, I can see why you would think that that's not the greatest wide receiver of all time. Uh, okay, it, it is, it's TL. I feel like the, the argument for Jerry Rice not being the great, I think it ends with this the guy was 42 years old and caught for over a thousand yards. With, with the, I think it was like twelve hundred yards, whatever it was, with the Oakland Raiders. Then, then Oakland Raiders. Like, yeah. come on, what are we talking about? The fact that someone wanted to give a forty-two-year-old wide receiver an NFL contract is insane. <laughs> I mean, thirty. I think it was when he was thirty-three years old. He caught for eighteen hundred yards. The, the yeah. stuff he was doing now. If, if a receiver is thirty-three years old, is like okay, he's on his way out. The, Jerry Rice, and this is why his records records will never be broken. He had. From the age of 33 on, he had like another career. Like for a normal guy, he had like even better than their normal career from the age of 33 to 42. So again, he should be on the route Mount Rushmore. I respect everything he did. I just had I just was drawn more to Tara Owens. And and I grew up watching who can make a play? I can. Who can make a play? I can. I love me some me. I just I just grew up watching that. So yeah. You know, that was a big part. Born in 1987. Uh, now, the other two guys. Here we go, man. Charles Woodson. You know, I, I grew up watching, you know, David Boston versus Charles Woodson, Woodson at Michigan. And then watching Woodson and what he was, you know, for the Raiders and them coming on TV and me just watching that. And, you know, again, young guy. I wanted to play cornerback. Like my, my uncle, uh, my uncle Tracy, he, he was a defensive back my brother ended up being a you know a really good all-state defensive back and for me it was like man Charles Woodson he exemplifies what a DB is supposed to look like and then you continue to watch him and everybody thought he was washed he goes to Green Bay and then boom I mean ends up being defensive player of the year you know winning the Super Bowl it, it was just great watching him and then being able to meet him being able to meet and be on stage with him I did a podcast with Charles Woodson on stage in Las Vegas uh, so, and, and I couldn't let him know, like, you're kind of my hero, but I'm not going to tell him. I'm just like, you know, Hey, he's calling me croc. And I'm like, <laughs> Charles Woodson just called me croc, <laughs> you know? And I did not let him know how big of a fan of his I was, but, uh, Charles Woodson, I just grew up watching him. My brother and I can 49er fan, cowboy fan, but we had a poster of Charles Woodson on our door. So when you came into our room, we're about to walk into our room. That was the first thing you saw. It was Woodson in the Raider uniform. But we were that big a fan, a fan of his. So. so when it comes to Deion Sanders, are you and your brother like, you know, the meme with the handshake? You guys I think like, that's where we come together. Okay. You know, we can acknowledge like what he meant for us. But I got one more guy. All right. We got Deion Teo, Charles Woodson, and who else is on your Mount Crockmore? You know, you could get this is another defensive back. And I feel like maybe one of the more underrated defensive backs, at least of my lifetime. And I thought this guy was special. In college, he actually played both ways, um, was drafted really high, top five defensive back out of Georgia. Do you know who this cornerback is? Uh, I missed the first part of his resume. You said top five pick out of Georgia. Top five pick out of Georgia, played both ways in college. Okay. Uh, was involved in a trade for a running back. It was a big trade at that time. Oh, 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 yeah. So you're talking two way guys, and you're talking high end athletes. You're talking Champ Bailey. I'm talking Champ Bailey. Yeah. I love. He was a guy who I I would run. Oh, is, is Monday Night Football Champ Bailey's playing? Like, let me go watch Champ Bailey. You know, he he. There were these urban legends or myths about what he was doing at practice like where he went like a hundred straight reps of not giving up a catch you know like those were the kind of the things i would hear when i was younger uh i wore number four all through high school because 
uh, Champ Bailey. That was his college football number. So I wore number four. Uh, man, just another, again, uh, another great. The only time I didn't wear number four in high school was my sophomore year because for whatever reason, number four was missing. But outside of that, freshman year, junior year, senior year, I was number four. And Champ Bailey was a big reason why. So uh, great, great, great player. I feel like he's very underrated when yeah. people talk about great DBs. I, I could swap him out for Ed Reed, but Champ Bailey was just my – he was my guy. Yeah. Ed Reed would be right. If I if, uh, if the Croc, uh, if the Mount Crockmore was five players, you know what? Ed Reed would be that next guy. You know what you should do, Croc, is just, just jump fully in with both feet and make it all DBs and kick out T.O. for Ch for uh, for Ed Reed. So it can be all DBs because I know that's what you really want to do. <laughs> all right, I'll kick T.O. out. I love T.O. No, T.O. follows me on social media. That was pretty cool. But um, I love T.O. We'll kick T.O. out. We'll go Ed Reed. And and, and the, the way that Ed Reed – again, I, I was a Miami Hurricane fan, super random. Just my brother was a Florida State fan. I love – like – I watched Miami and, you know, Roscoe Parrish and McGahee, Gore, Clinton Portis. Uh, I mean, just so many great uh, – Kellen Winslow, who was actually my teammate uh, when I was on the Jets. But just so many guys that came out of Miami, and Ed Reed was a really big part of what they were doing there. He was a special player coming out of college. And watching him at the pro level, I, I mean, he – he like, why did he score so many touchdowns? You know, how did he trick uh, 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 quarterbacks? You know, how did he get Peyton Manning? How is he on the far hash? Bates Peyton, Peyton Manning to throw it down the far sideline and he get there. You know, like th just these things that you're not supposed to do. And then he pick it off and it's like, oh, it's going to the crib because Ed Reed picked it off. Uh, just a, a really, a really special, special player. And um, he hurt the 49ers, had an interception against the 49ers in the Super Bowl 2012. But uh, I, I definitely – that was another player I loved watching Ed Reed play the game of football. There you go. That's Mount Crockmore. Uh, who's on your list? Let us know at BD Peacock at Cro Crocky209 or in the YouTube comments. Make sure you subscribe while you're there. And, of course, you can subscribe everywhere you are listening to this podcast. Uh, one more subject I wanted to talk about. We'll, we'll tease it for tomorrow because I got some takes on uh, what the difference is for head coach, former 49ers defensive coordinators, and current head coaches, D'Amico Ryans and Robert Sala in their new destinations. All that and more tomorrow right here, Lockdown 49ers.